while, we're going to continue our coverage of the most talented players of all time. And today we're going to look at the game of Joel's Rule Capablanca when he was just four years old. Someone in his chess club in Havana, I believe, Ramon Iglesias, challenged the young Capablanca to an odds game. So you see the white queen is missing. This is intentional. I haven't set up the board wrong. So White was this adult player, experienced player in the club. I'm not exactly sure what strength. If you, if you happen to know, please leave a comment on YouTube. Wiki describes his opponent actually as a leading player. So maybe he was one of the strongest in the chess club. By the way, um, so this was when Capablanca had just really learnt the chess by watching his father. By December 1901, apparently, according to Wiki, when he was 13, he defeated the leading C Cuban player, Juan Corzo, by the score of four wins, three losses, and six draws. So he played e4, and Kappa played e5. So Capablanca was already keen on classical openings by playing e5. After knight f3, he played, though, knight f6. So he was um, pioneering Kramnik's favourite defence at this young age, the um, Petrov. So a very solid defence, symmetrical. After knight takes e5, he played knight takes e4. And after d4, he played d6. So white retreated the knight. And now Capablanca didn't play um, the theory move d5. He actually played bishop e7. Still a useful developing move. And after bishop d3, he decided just to put his knight back on f6. So white played now c4. Capablanca castled. And after knight c3, Knight c6 was played. So he's putting a bit of pressure on the d4 square. Maybe he's preparing bishop g4. After a3, he plays now a6. So that potentially is useful for sporting b5 later. After bishop d2, he plays actually b6 now. So he's delaying b5, and potentially he's got his bishop to go to b7. After white castled queenside, he actually puts his bishop on d7. After king b1, he now plays quite an aggressive move, knight a5. So it's got the potential threat of knight b3. And also the potential positional idea of playing c5 to blockade that c4 pawn. And maybe, you know, gain some counterplay against white's king by a later b5. After rook c1, Capablanca did play actually knight b3 here and gained potentially white's dark squared bishop. But he didn't take it here, he actually played c5. And after d5, he now played rook e8. So actually the knight has a different intention. Instead of simply snapping off the bishop, maybe Capablanca is thinking more positionally that if he gets his knight to d4, he can kind of try and dislocate White's position with this central pawn. After h4, Kappa actually now plays b5, so he's generating some counterplay already against the White King. White continues with this brutal kind of attack on the King side. He's a Queen down after all and has to get at Capablanca's King to gain some compensation. But now Capablanca plays the positional Knight d4, so he's actually dislocating White's position a little bit with this move. After knight takes cd, knight e4, what black now took on c4, and if white plays rook takes c4, then there's bishop b5, and that's kind of annoying to be able to play then bishop takes d3 check and knight takes e4. So white decided to take on f6, after bishop takes f6, now took on c4. But Capablanca bravely now took the g-pawn, so not minding that white's got the open file against this king. There simply isn't enough force to make that an exploitable weakness here. After bishop d3, Kemper now played bishop f3, forking rook and the pawn on d5. So after rook h3, he does take that centre pawn. So it seems that even at this young age, Capablanca he's dominating the position in the centre with his two bishops nicely centralised and a nice dislocating pawn on d4, and also prospects for attacking 
White's king on the b-file, so he's really used the pawn structure effectively to open lines for his pieces and gain necessary counterplay if needed. White continued with the attack with h5. Capablanca was not worried. He played bishop e6, and after rook g3, he now tried to strengthen his king position by playing g6. So after f4, it's clear that White is desperately trying to mount the pressure on the g-file. So it's in interesting how the four-year-old parries this pressure. He first plays bishop h4, and after rook g1, he now evacuates his king to h8. So he's giving the opportunity for himself to play rook g8 if necessary. After f5, White's still trying to rip open these lines quite aggressively. Capablanca takes that and exchanges off the, the light-squared bishops. But still, White's attack persists now with bishop h6. So Capablanca is faced with this threat of bishop g7, with the potential of drawing by perpetual check. In this critical moment, Capablanca doesn't falter. He defends with rook g8, and after rook cg2, White's still trying this on. Capablanca simply took on g2 and now played queen f6, volunteering to give up his queen if necessary if bishop g7. So again, he's parried this critical threat. White played bishop g7 anyway, and after these exchanges, it is now clear that White is hopelessly lost without any attacking compensation at all. After king c2, it's interesting that the four-year-old now centralised his king and gave the impression he was just going to queen his f-pawn with f4. And after king e2, king e4, he's still using his king to herd his pawns forward. At this point, his adult opponent resigned. So this is the earliest recorded win of Capablanca, and perhaps evidence that even at this age, you know, he seemed to be aware of quite a few concepts in the game. Central control, queenside counterplay, defending against attacks, you know, making space for his king. Let's have a look in overview and summary at this game again. So um, Capablanca classically had control of the centre from the opening. After bishop e7, he had quite a solid position. After c4, castled, and this knight c6 potentially had ideas of bishop g4. But actually Capablanca played quite slowly now on the queen side with a6, perhaps a bit nervous about white's pawns going forward on the queen side. And now b6, and after castles he played bishop d7. So the white king went to b1, and now Capablanca played knight a5. So knight a5 introduces ideas of knight b3 and also c5, encouraging white to play d5, in which b5 will generate good counterplay against the white king. So after rook c1, he did play knight b3, but instead of snapping up that bishop, he actually just played c5. So he's just drumming up some queenside counterplay potentially now, after d5, with b5. But first, he plays rook e8, and after h4, now he plays b5. So he's actually volunteering to sacrifice a pawn as well. But maybe he has seen that if white wins that pawn, then the d5 pawn will drop. So he'll gain more central control. After g4, he now plays knight d4. So he's really interfering with white's central control, as well as getting this kind of dislocating pawn on d4. And after knight e4, now b takes c4 is well timed to disrupt white's protection of the e4 knight. So white's now played knight takes f6, and after bishop takes f6, bishop takes c4, Capablanca snapped that g pawn. And defended successfully the attack now, first after bishop f3 winning white's d pawn, and now calmly defending on the g-line with g6, and giving his king now an escape square with king h8, supporting the idea of rook g8 if needed as a defence. So after f5, he took on f5, simplifying further, reducing white's attacking resources, and now rook g8 at the critical moment to defend against bishop g7. So white played rook cg2, still trying to get some sort of attacking prospect, but now this was snuffed out by Kappa, just taking the rook and playing queen f6, prepared to sacrifice the queen. Not only that, in this end game, interestingly, he marches his king now to the centre, giving the impression it will be plain sailing, 
just marching his f-pawn or d-pawn to queen. At this point, his adult opponent resigned. So many say Capablanca is the most talented player of all time. Perhaps this game, in a way, is kind of evidence for that assertion. How could a four-year-old play so well? Was he read chess books while he was in the womb? I'm not sure his, his parents were actually that good at chess. Um, his father apparently played, and you know he was watching his father playing a visitor. But um, to have comprehension of, of the game at this stage, and control of the centre, queenside counterplay, parrying threats, is quite incredible, even by today's standards, I think. Please leave any comments on YouTube. Thanks very much.